Let's talk about coal today. Coal is our most carbon intensive and dirtiest fuel. And those are two different things, right? So the carbon intensity, it's, um, it's, that's about greenhouse gas emissions, right? It's contribution to climate change. So of oil, coal, and natural gas, it's the most carbon intensive when we burn it. So basically more carbon out versus energy you get out. Um, but there's also a lot of other impacts. Drivers, what I'm talking about drivers is like, why do we use coal? What, why is it such a big part of our, our energy system? It's abundant, so meaning that a lot of the places that use coal have coal. Uh, so it's much more widespread than something like oil, right? It's not as concentrated. And so a lot of countries can use this as a domestic resource. And so that matters to a lot of countries. And it's been a big part of our energy system for a long time. So there is a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of capital investment that has gone into this industry that brings down the price because of the economies of scale. Right, so those are some of the big drivers. Barriers are numerous, especially on the environmental side. So we'll talk through some of these, air pollution, climate change, water pollution, solid waste. Um, it has all of these aspects which more and more um, has led to the decline of coal in the US in our electricity generation because natural gas is not only cheaper, but you don't have to deal with the sulfur emissions. You don't have to deal with the coal ash coming out of the power plant. It's just a cleaner fuel for um, our electricity utilities to deal with. And so a lot of the replacement is because of some of these externalities make it more challenging to deal with coal. We're gonna talk a little bit at the end about bankruptcy um, in the US coal mining industry and how that impacts not just the communities that have been producing coal for a long time uh, in the US, empowering our electricity generation, but it, it also impacts how the, the environment is impacted by those coal mines. Are they cleaned up? Are they closed properly? Things like that. And so those bankruptcies are a big deal and we'll talk about um, how that's impacting some of the environmental impacts from those, those coal, mine, coal mines. All right, and so kind of just status, big picture, what's happening in the US, it's been, coal use has been declining pretty steadily since 2007, um, despite you know, some you know, uh, administrations or politicians saying we're gonna bring back coal or we're gonna support coal, the market doesn't support it. And so it has been declining since 2007 um, because of market forces in addition to other things. Um, but in the world, it continues to grow. There was some talk that maybe coal hit this peak because during COVID, it went down. We're already back up to our pre-COVID peak of coal use. So we have not peaked in our coal consumption worldwide. So we're gonna talk about the significance of coal, give some big picture stories about it, talk about what it is, um, how it works you know, from mine to our use of it, and then really talk about the environmental and social impacts, where it's going in the future. So this is just a list of the top 10 countries that consume coal. And you can see China is the biggest by far in terms of coal consumption worldwide, followed by India where it's growing a lot, and then the US where it's declining. Okay, so those are kind of the big players in coal consumption. You've seen this before, but just to remind you, coal is a big piece of our energy resource picture um, in the world and in the US, so it's number two in the world, it's number three in the US, um, used to be number two until natural gas kind of took over that number two spot in the US, right? Oil is really used for transportation, so in the world, coal is really the number one resource for electricity production. So what do we use our coal for? Electricity is the biggest piece of the pie, so this is showing you both globally and in the US what we use our coal for, but it's not the only thing we use it for. We've talked a little bit about iron and steel, this non-metallic minerals industry, that's like cement and glass, things like that, those are often looked at as industries that are, that are very carbon intensive, very energy intensive, and are hard to decarbonize. And so when people are starting to talk about how do we decarbonize some of those industries, those two are big ones, where they're trying to figure out alternatives to coal to try to decarbonize those, those very energy intensive um, industries. And then you can see it's kind of used in a variety of, of other places, um, you know, in some places in the developing world, even for lighting, heating, and cooking, um, coal is used. And you saw that in some of, some of your videos. All right, you've seen this before, way back in lecture one, when we were talking about the energy transition. Um, just to remind you that 
this is kind of a pictorial view of the energy system that is coal. Right, so coal coming in is our energy resource and we're getting an electricity service out. It's a very uh, inefficient system. And much of that efficiency loss, which we'll talk about next week in electricity generation, is at the power station. It's because of that steam cycle power plant, that heat engine, they can only be so efficient. Uh, they're inherently inefficient. And so we're putting in 100 units of coal, we're getting one unit of energy service out. Um, with all of those externalities, right? That's why it matters. That's why it matters that it's not so efficient. It's because it has all those externalities associated with it when you're using it. So we've got to do this system in a better way, especially as we're trying to improve access to modern energy around the world, right? We have to try to do it in the most efficient way possible. It makes it the easiest to decarbonize if we can provide those services in the most efficient way possible. Okay. So let's bring it down um, to just looking at electricity. Um, so this is looking at world electricity generation. Again, coal is really, that's the predominant thing it's used for, right? We saw 75% of the coal is going to electricity generation, um, and it's still growing. So you can see in the, in the chart on the right, we had this little downward dip during COVID, when a lot of economies had just had less electricity demand. But we're already back up um, beyond pre-COVID levels of coal demand. Um, so it was a temporary dip, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about when will we actually get to peak coal, um, and we'll talk about some of those estimates. So big piece of the picture for electricity generation, a third of, of the world's electricity generation. So the interesting thing, and one thing I wanna point out, the difference between coal and oil is there's a lot of alternatives for electricity generation in in our systems, right? We can use natural gas, we can use wind, we can use solar, we can use geothermal, there's a lot of options. So coal is, in that sense, easier to replace than oil with our transportation system where there aren't as many options. You have to change out either the vehicles themselves to be electric, you know, electricity char charged, or you have to change out the, what the, the engine so it operates on biofuels. It's, it's not as easy to replace. So, it's part of the reason in the US we've really seen this decline in coal because it, it's just producing electricity and we can produce electricity a lot of different ways, a lot of other domestic ways, right? Solar, wind, those are domestic resources as well. The growth of coal consumption in China. You can see that 10 year period from 2002 to 2012 was really a growth period for coal consumption in China. But just to put that in perspective, it was a growth period in kind of all of the above for China. As, as China's energy needs grew, they just kind of expanded electricity production in all different resources. So you're gonna see their growth in, in all sorts of things, in wind, in solar, in other resources. It's not just coal. Um, hydro grew a lot. So China was kind of just trying to meet the growing energy demand um, in their country in that time frame. We've seen it drop off, the growth drop off a little bit right now because there is some slowing down of the economy. So it's very economy-based slowdown in that electricity demand in China. India is seeing a lot of growth, which you guys saw in the video, and then you can see the US, Europe, are places where coal demand is, is declining. All right, so that was global. Let's bring it down to the US where we're at. Um, so coal is 20% of our electricity generation today. When I was sitting in your seat in 2004, it was 50%. And people thought it was gonna be 50% forever because it was cheap, it was available, we're never gonna run out of coal, we've got so much coal. Um, it was believed it was gonna be 50% of our mix forever. And so policies and markets have really driven natural gas, wind, and solar to take over that electricity demand from coal. And so a lot of that started with the horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing revolution where we suddenly had an abundance of natural gas supply in the US, which made it cheap. And so that was a pretty easy transition for a lot of utilities. They transitioned to natural gas, and you can see that growth. And then as, as wind and solar has co have come on the, the landscape and are now cheaper than running existing coal, we've seen renewables take off as well. Uh, again, they, they're just easier to deal with. Wind and solar are things that, that are, are relatively easy to put in place, you're talking about two years, permitting is easier, 
You can add to it. You can grow your farm really easily instead of the really capital and environmental intensive process to get something like a coal-fired power plant approved. And so we're seeing in the US this decline in coal, increase in natural gas and wind and solar. Okay. All right. So that's what that looks like in the US. So let's talk about where the coal is. We're still producing quite a bit of coal. We're still using it for 20% of our electricity production um, in the US. So worldwide, the big proved reserves, now remember proved reserves means we found the coal and we've done enough to actually show that we can get the coal. Right? It's more than, if you remember your McKelvey, more than the resources, we're down to what's, what we can get economically and tech, technologically. So those are approved reserves of coal. Australia, China, China, Russia, US, those are big players in coal. But honestly, we haven't looked that hard. Unlike oil, we have a lot of coal. And we don't have to look that hard to find it. And so there's probably way more coal that we could get out that we haven't even tried very hard to find. And so these are probably low estimates in terms of the amount of coal that we have and we could get to it if we wanted to. So we're never going to run out. We're going to definitely kill our planet before we run out of coal. Okay? So that's where they are in the world. And then the producers, obviously China is a big producer. Um, they're going to want to use domestic coal as much as possible, although they are also a big importer of coal now as their coal consumption has grown. Um, Australia, um, Indonesia, those are major exporters. So they're not really using it so much domestically. They're exporting it. All right, so what does it look like in the US? We're going to talk about these different ranks of coal. But just think of the red is like the high quality coal like I've got in my earrings. The, the light blue is like low quality coal. It's not as carbon inten you know, intensive, so it's not as energy dense. Um, and you can kind of see where they are. Appalachian region, that's where we talked about the mountaintop removal, right? That's where undergrounding mining or mountaintop removal is going on. Powder River Basin, you can see up there in the green, that's providing a lot of the coal today. And we'll talk about the air pollution policies that really led to that transition and where we get our coal in the, in the US. So what does that production look like? So again, here I'm showing you recoverable reserves. So that's like proved reserves. So I mentioned Montana actually has a lot of coal, but because of their policies, they're not economically and technologically recoverable because a, a lot of them you, you can't get at. Um, Montana had a lot of impacts from other types of mining, gold mining, metals mining, things like that. And so they put in policies that are pretty restrictive on mining and the coal industry never really took off there. Wyoming, very big provider of, of coal production um, from that, that same kind of basin, the Powder River Basin. And so the, you can see the big producers are Wyoming and West Virginia. This picture has changed a lot um, as coal has declined. Because as we'll see, we used to have you know, well over 1,000 mines, um, almost you know, 1,200 mines. Now we have less than half of that open. And so this picture keeps changing as we continue to close mines uh, around, around the US. Um, but there are places where they're looking at exporting coal from the US to keep some of those mines operating. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. OK, so what is coal? Coal is a fossil fuel. It is the most chemically complex fossil fuel. right? So it is, it is a solid. It is very carbon intensive. It's very energy dense. Um, it's a solid, but it has all sorts of other stuff in it, right? So our coal is made from swamps. We talked about the water that's from the origin of coal, right? So coal, is, it's, its resource is swampy biomass, okay? And so that swampy biomass died. It got squished. Time, temperature, and pressure squished it from low quality or pre-coal, which we call like peat, into a little bit like low quality coal lignite into coal. And so when we're talking about the energy density of this solid fuel, a 20 meter plant seam became a one meter seam of coal. So you can imagine all of that biomass getting squished into coal. And that's why it's so energy dense. And so when you're replacing things like wood or charcoal with coal, it's a much more energy dense fuel because you've squished that ancient biomass over millions of years. OK, so let's talk about the ranks of coal. Um, so peat, peat is like, like I said, pre-coal. We have a lot of peat in, 
uh, in the world, it's some, in places where it's swampy. Um, some places use that for an energy resource. Uh, places like Ireland have used peat for a long time as an energy resource. It's something you can collect from the surface and, and burn it. And then it goes through the, kind of this, um, this ranking in terms of how squished and how energy intense did that coal get. And so at the top, we see lignite, very low carbon, very low energy dense coal, all the way through bituminous and subbituminous to things like the anthracite. And so for all of these bituminous, subbituminous, lignite, we use all of those for electricity production. Anthracite is really just used for heating. Um, it's metallurgic coal, it's, it's a higher quality. Let's talk about how we get the coal. I mentioned already that you know, we only have you know, 550 mines operating in the US. It used to be more like 1,200. So there's been a huge decline in the amount of mining that we do in the US. Um, and you can see how productive those mines are. So east of the Mississippi, that's where mountaintop removal and undergrounding, right? Lot of mines, but only 40% of the coal. In the west, they tend to be fewer mines, but they're bigger. And those are the open pit mining, right? So in the west, there's only 10% of the mines, but we're getting about 60% of our coal from the west. And so what does that look like? So surface mining, underground mining are kind of the two categories. You saw some of this in your videos. Open pit mining is very similar to what we talked about with oil sands and tar sands. You're clearing the topsoil, you're getting to a relatively shallow coal seam, digging all of the coal out. The way you close that mine is you put dirt back in and you know, hopefully restore the surface to something that looked like what it was before you removed everything. So that's open pit mining, that's what we do in the west those bigger mines and a lot of our production. And the east is eastern US and, and lots of other parts of the world. We're still doing a lot of underground mining. Um, so this has become more mechanized, which you guys saw in one of your videos, but it's still a much more dangerous type of mining for miners. You have to worry about the, the pockets of CO2 and methane that might be in there. So you have to constantly measure oxygen levels in your mine. You have to worry about collapses. You have to worry about um, just coal dust and things like that, breathing it in that space. So a lot more health concerns with our underground mining than our open pit mining. Um, but a lot bigger, I would say, a lot of times environmental impacts with this surface mining or mountaintop removal. OK, so what's the process? Um, it's similar to other fossil fuels. None of this is going to surprise you, right? So uh, when you're doing a mine, you find the resource, you do some planning, you have to get permitting, you have to have access to the land, you lease it. Um, for surface mining, you're often drilling down and putting charges in to blow up all of the, the surface um, material before you start digging it off of your mine seam. Underground, you're doing more excavation, also can involve a lot of uh, dynamiting to do that. And then in terms of the mechanization and the size, with these big surface mines, you can get these large trucks in there, very similar to the oil sands. Um, there's a video about a drag line, which is one of the biggest machines in the world that actually digs out coal from surface mining. So you're using these big machines, and you get pretty much all of the coal when you do surface mining. Underground mining, depending on how you do it, sometimes you have to leave some of the coal in place so that the ceiling doesn't collapse. Um, but you're not getting all of the coal out. It's a lot more risk involved with our underground mining. Um, and we'll, we'll show some of the advancements that are taking place to reduce that risk. A lot going on in the slide. I'll let you guys look at it later. But as we talked about, coal was really important for our industrial revolution. It was a big part of when we figured out how to do a steam engine, we figured out how to do railroads. It was a really big portion of our industrial revolution. So we've been using coal for a long, long time. And then the getting of coal has become more and more mechanized, less and less people involved as you increase the mechanization of coal mining. OK, so what do they look like? This is just what we talked about, surface mining. You're taking the overburden off. You're digging out the coal. Sometimes you have multiple seams, so you'll, you'll dig out the overburden again and get the coal out. And then you know, you're supposed to put it back. Put the dirt back, try to plant some trees or something, try to make it look like, at least in the US, that's our rudder regulations say, to make it look something like what it was before. It will also obviously be 
subsided, so it's going to be lower because you've removed some of the rock, right, with, with the coal. To give you a sense of scale, so these are the trucks that they use both for the oil sands and for, for open pit coal mining. And so you can see what people look like next to the tires of these big trucks to give you a sense of scale. And then that's those trucks in these open pit mines. Okay, they are enormous. And one of the videos show that to you in India where there's been an expansion of these surface mines affecting a lot of communities, affecting a lot of, of forest land, things like that. They're massive mines, um, big places that are impacted by this. And then uh, you can see the little truck there. This is just a picture of what that drag line looks like. So one of the biggest machines in the world is used for coal mining. All right, so coal, we're using it for electricity production. I mentioned there are other places where it's an important energy resource locally for communities. And so there's a video you can watch about this in India. Some people collect it for themselves for their own cooking, heating, lighting needs. Um, so it is part of this, we, in terms of transitioning communities to modern sources of energy, that's one of the areas we have to tackle because that is an important or sometimes the only viable energy resource for many communities around the world. All right, mountaintop removal. Um, this is something we really um, only do a lot in the US in the eastern part of our country. Um, over 500 mountains have been permanently lost to mountaintop removal because what you're doing is you're blowing up the mountain and basically filling in the valley next to it and it creates like flat land. Um, a lot of damage to the streams. So th those valley streams um, are often damaged, not just from being filled in, but also contaminated from exposing the coal to rain and things like that. And then all of those metals that we care about in coal end up in those underground stream beds and then end up downstream, right? And so this is a major environmental legacy issue for mountaintop removal um, in the Eastern US. One of the articles that I gave you is they're looking at, can we clean up those streams and use some of those heavy metals in making batteries? So people are trying to figure out how do we clean up those streams and how do we make it a market-driven thing so that that cleanup will actually happen. How do they get to do this? There has been policies put in place to allow this, to basically allow these mines not to comply with our Clean Water Act in the, in the US. And so they have waivers that allow them to fill in these stream beds with the mountaintop removal to get access to that coal. Okay, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is a mountain, or it was a mountain until um, they filled in the stream and started mining it there. Okay, a little bit about underground mining. So you've probably heard the phrase, I'm guessing, canary in a coal mine, right? That's a, that's a real thing. They would bring canaries down um, early on when we didn't have sophisticated ways of measuring oxygen levels, methane amounts, uh, CO2 amounts in the mine. Canaries are very sensitive to air pollutants. And so if your canary dies, you hightail it out of the mine, right? That is literally what they were, that was their warning system uh, back in the day. So they would literally bring canaries um, down into the mines. Children and, and child labor um, was a big part of coal mining in the US. It's no longer allowed, but it is still uh, a portion of the coal mining done in the world. Why? Why, are coal, why is coal such a good place for kids for underground? They can get into little places. They can get into smaller seams to get the coal out. And so child labor and coal mines, um, there's a, a video about the challenges in Afghanistan um, in, the, in the readings, if you want to know more about that. Um, it is still a challenge. It's no longer allowed in the US for coal mining, um, but it was a, a big part of, of coal mining for, for a long time in the US. All right, so how do we get it out of underground mining? There's kind of like two big waves. One is called the room and pillar method, which basically just means you're leaving coal behind in order to hold up the ceiling. And so you just dig out tunnels of the coal through the seam, and the rest of the coal you leave in place to keep the ceiling from collapsing on you. The other way to do it is called long wall method, where you're mining the coal back and forth and just letting the mine collapse behind the coal. Now, you can imagine that has impacts on the surface, right? So you're gonna see subsidence in a lot of places where they do long, long wall mining, 
where they're removing that whole layer of coal and nothing is holding up the surface and, and the mines are actually collapsing as you go. Mechanization is really changed in mining overall. And so coal is not an exception to that. And so one of the videos shows in China how they're using AI, they're using more automated things. So they'll have less coal miners in the mine um, and able to monitor the equipment remotely. Um, so this is all about health, safety, and obviously cost reduction um, for mechanizing some of that, that coal mining. And so that is a change that's going on, like I said, not just in coal mining, but in mining overall. A lucky few of you will get to go to a Black Diamond Mines um, field trip. So this is really fun. Many people don't actually know that we have a coal mine right in the Northeast Bay. Uh, powered industry in the Bay Area um, in the late 1800s. It's very, very low. It's just like very low quality coal. It's like the worst coal. High sulfur, low quality, crappy coal here in this mine. And so once we were able to get coal in from other parts of the country on our rail system, this mine system shut down. It couldn't compete because it's such low, low quality coal and the whole community basically left because there was, there was no jobs left in this area once the coal mine closed. And then you'll actually see kind of on top of this mine is a silica mine. And so it actually has very high quality sand that they use that they used for a long time for glass and other things that, that require silica. So they'll take you through both the coal mine and the silica mine in this location. All right, so we get the coal out of the ground and then we gotta move it to where we want it, right? And so we do that in the US primarily by train. So where are we producing most of our coal, right? It's in Wyoming, right? It's in that Powder River Basin. Remember, it's like 60% of our coal. Much of our coal-fired power plants are east of the Mississippi. So you've got to move that coal across our country to the power plants that are demanding the coal for electricity production. And so that is uh, and remains the number one use of our railway system in the US is for moving coal around. Okay, so most of it we move it by, by railroad. We move some by water. So think about that as like inner, inner waterways. So like the Mississippi River, some of it across some of the Great Lakes. So we do sue some water transport of coal and then the conveyor and the truck, that's really just like, conveyors are very short distances and then the truck is really um, places we don't have a rail system. Um, and so you're just kind of filling in gaps in our transportation system. So when you think coal transport, think railroad. And you can see that those blue lines are really showing you the transport of the coal. And so much of it is from the Wyoming area and moving it to the eastern part of the US where the, the electricity production and the coal power plants are. So that's domestic. International coal trade is growing as well. So I would say, you know, a decade ago, we didn't really talk much about coal trade. There wasn't much going on. Most of the places that consume it, like China and the US, they had their own coal. And so they weren't trading it. But as China's demand has grown beyond its own mines to provide its, its coal consumption needs, Trade has really grown. And so much of that trade is going to Asia Pacific um, from places like Australia and Indonesia. And so you can see the growth in coal trade and much of that is by water. So what I'm showing you here are the big exporters, Australia and Indonesia as being big exporters, and then the importers, China, and more so every year, India, um, importing coal from other countries. Also because they can get it more cheaply right, than they can from their domestic mines. So to bring it down locally um, and talk a little bit about Utah and the Bay Area. So there is a proposed coal exporting um, terminal in Oakland. Um, and so if you're from the Bay Area, if you want to learn more about it, you can, you can read up about it in the news. But the basic story goes that the city made this agreement um, with Tagami's company. It's a, the person that's running this company to say, yeah, you can build an export terminal here. Um, they had some land, it was city land, they were leasing it to them. But there wasn't any conversation, or they go back and forth, whether there was any conversation about what he was going to be exporting. And so the city believed that there was an understanding that coal wouldn't be one of those exports, and Takami is, is disputing that. And so this is back in 2013. It's been in the courts. They just had a, a recent 
court ruling come out a couple days ago. The judge is going to rule on it sometime probably next week because I just had final statements. Um, but it's this battle. And the challenge with a coal exporting terminal is that that coal dust does definitely impact the local communities. Um, so it's not contained. Sometimes they're covered, but even when they're covered, that coal dust blows into neighboring communities. And that coal dust has some of the same stuff that we talk about with coal ash. It has the cadmium, the mercury, the lead, the things that we don't want in our, our communities. Um, so this is a very local battle that is going on that's getting some media attention, um, but it is ongoing. It's, it's still very much up in the air if we're going to have a coal terminal here in Oakland. And I mentioned Utah because that's where the coal would be coming from. So the agreement that Tagami's company has is with coal mining in Utah. Again, it's the effort by the coal mining industry to maintain their operations by looking at exports as decline in, in demand um, is, is impacting their bottom line in the US. All right, so we get the coal out of the ground, we move it to the electricity generation facility, and we make electricity. And we'll talk more about a steam cycle power plant uh, next week as we get into electricity systems. This is a coal-fired power plant in England. Um, I like to show this picture because those big hourglass looking things are cooling towers. And a lot of times people associate those in their mind with nuclear power plants. The reason is, is because those cooling towers are for large facilities. They're just cooling towers. They're just ways of cooling the water in that steam cycle. But a large coal-fired power plant, for example, would also use those kind of hourglass cooling towers. Um, you wouldn't invest in those big ones if you had a smaller facility. Right? So just to reframe that if you see those, it doesn't necessarily mean a nuclear power plant. Often in nuclear power plants also have those because they're big. So you use that kind of cooling with a big power plant. But this one is, is obviously a big coal-fired power plant. You can see they have like five of those cooling towers. So we use coal for electricity. We've already talked about this a lot. So this is just showing in the US. Um, how we're using bituminous and subbituminous coal to power 20% of our electricity generation. And much of those coal plants are east of the Mississippi. And so that was a big impact on acid rain. And we'll talk about the policies that led to that shift in, in coal mining production. The other thing that you guys saw in your article is using coking coal for steel, metallurgic coal for, for other industries. Again, a hard to decarbonize, very energy intensive industry, which is why there's a lot of attention on new ways to make green steel or other, um, other products like cement. So for the last 30 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about the environmental and social impact. So you see in the charts like this in this class, trying to give you a sense that there are environmental impacts along the whole supply chain for coal. Right? Just like on some of our other industries. It's not just the burning of the coal that's the problem. It's the mining, it's the transportation, it's the processing. All of those have social and environmental impacts. So this is just kind of an overview and we're gonna go into more detail on, on these different aspects. One way to think of it is trying to put a dollar sign on the environmental impacts of, of our, our coal use. And so this is just one study that did that, tried to put a, a dollar amount on the environmental and social impacts from using coal. And you can see the kind of a low, medium, and high externality um, gauge. And I just wanted to give you a sense that these costs range are anywhere from 10 to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and so they're two to five times the wholesale price of electricity. So this is very much when we talk about social costs versus private plus externalities, we are not taking into account those externalities in the private cost of coal, which is why it's been such a low cost resource for so long. We're not taking into account all the externalities and there's a lot of different aspects to that. So let's start upstream, coal mining. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about surface impacts. Um, we also get acid um, drainage into waterways. Once you expose that coal seam to water, that water can uh, infiltrate the mine and then run out of the mine into waterways and contaminate it with a lot of these heavy metals that we worry about. Um, and then we've talked some about some of the things like deforestation, habitat destruction, things like that. So very environmentally uh, 
impactful on the coal mining side of things. Coal mines also contain methane. Okay, and so there's varying estimates of this. This one says it's about a third of the global emissions from the energy sector. Some say that's an underestimate. It's more like 40% of the methane emissions from the energy sector. But the, the takeaway here is that it's big. We talk about methane emissions from our natural gas system, because natural gas is methane. And those are ones that are easy, right? We should be able to fix those. Those are leaks in pipelines and wells, and we have the tools, and we know how to do it. We just need the policies and the political will to do it. Coal mining is much harder. When you do a surface mine and you open that seam, that methane that is trapped in that coal is just going to be released. It is much harder to trap that, to capture it, to try to get rid of it. It's often just vented. Um, and so this is part of coal's impact on climate change, is the release of this potent greenhouse gas when you're doing the, the mining. And so this is a problem both in surface mining and in underground mining, where it's often just vented to the atmosphere. We talked a little bit about safety. Um, so the good news story here is that safety overall has gotten better over time as we've had better regulations, as we've had better systems, as we've mechanized some of the system. Safety has gotten better. Fatalities have gone down in our coal mining. But it is still a risky system. And maybe not as much for the fatalities, but in the longer term health impacts from breathing coal dust breathing the, the coal ash, having to deal with coal ash. We've seen exposure to heavy metals um, from people cleaning up coal ash that leads to things like cancer. And so it's more these longer term health impacts from our coal industry that we're seeing today as um, mining has, has gotten safer overall. So I talked a little bit about coal dust. Okay, so coal dust is just the stuff that gets blown off the coal. Right? So you can kind of see when you pass around the coal, it's like this, this rock, you can imagine there's like dust on it. So the wind blows, you get coal dust coming off of the coal. A lot of our trains are not covered, they're just open um, train cars. And so you get a lot of coal dust, you can kind of see it in that picture, blowing off the coal trains. Uh, why don't we cover them? It's not required, and it's just extra time and hassle. Right? And so that is something we could do. Um, to reduce coal dust and how that's impacting communities where these coal trains are coming through a lot, right? And so it impacts certain communities with the coal dust. Coal dust, again, has all those heavy metals that we really worry about people ingesting, breathing, um, getting into their, their water system. So that's like mining, and then we move the coal around, and then we burn it in our power plants. So when we burn it in our power plants, what, some of the things we worry about is the air pollution. Right? So coal has all of those things in it, mercury, lead, sulfur. Uh, those would all be emitted with the emissions as you're burning the coal and also end up in the coal ash, the solid waste that's left behind. And so that can have widespread impacts um, because if it's getting up into the atmosphere, it can move long distances and impact places far downstream of where the burning is happening. And so it is much higher air pollution than any of our other fossil fuels um, because it's like that all of that swamp it's all the stuff that's in there is squished into our coal okay so the other things we worry about are those heavy metals we've talked a lot about that and the solid waste um, which i'm going to talk a little bit more about um, in a few minutes so let's talk about climate change impacts and greenhouse gas emissions we mentioned that coal is the most carbon intensive fossil fuel meaning that we have the most carbon emissions from burning it in terms of the energy we get out. Um, and so this is just a chart showing you that difference. So tons of carbon per the energy you're getting out. Coal very much more carbon intensive than our other fossil fuels. And then we talked about the methane emissions contributing to greenhouse gases, which again, we're, those estimates might be an underestimate. Estimate. Uh, we're not really sure, especially globally, how much methane is being released from a lot of the coal mines. So what are some of the policies we have in place? The EPA has long regulated um, the emissions from coal-fired power plants, or really any electricity generation, but it really only impacts coal-fired power plants, um, on things like mercury and sulfur. So this regulation started with um, a, a regulation that was a cap and trade. It was an air pollution standard where they had to lower the total amount of sulfur and NOx that was being emitted from coal-fired power plants. And they could trade on 
who's doing that? Who's installing the scrubber? And they could, there was a cap and trade system, right? And they could trade those credits. But the cap kept going down over time, and we saw a, a large reduction in acid rain from our coal-fired power plants with this policy. Because we can scrub those pollutants out of the, the stacks, out of the air, so we don't have to emit them. We have technology to scrub them out. It just needs policy to require it because it makes it more energy intensive. It is a cost, right? And so that was a very successful cap and trade program that happened in the 90s. So there was scrubbers installed, and then there was also this moving of what coal people were buying from the Appalachian high sulfur coal to the, the Wyoming low sulfur coal to improve those sulfur emissions. This policy had to be at the federal level because that air pollution went across state lines. And so when you have Pennsylvania being impacted by Ohio, you needed a federal policy that really regulated that acid rain. Okay, so that's kind of the history. We also have the mercury and air toxic standards, MATS, which has kind of been this back and forth policy. So I, I give some of the, the history here. Enforcement began in 2016, then it was reversed, then we're going back to reinforcing it. It's been a little bit of a challenge for the coal industry to know and plan, but it isn't the biggest thing that's impacting the coal industry. So there, you don't hear about this a lot because coal-fired power plants are really just trying to compete on the market right now. Um, and a lot of them are shutting down. And so these policies come up less and less. What would replace the acid rain policy is this cross-state air pollution rule, which again has been in the courts and been battled back and forth in different administrations. But it is in place. And again, it's to reduce these emissions that have cross-state impacts. And so this is a success story where we've reduced a lot of the air pollution from the coal-fired power plants that are still operating. To show you what the coal looked like, so like I said, we were getting a lot of our coal from Mount Appalachia, and with the Clean Air Act, we started getting much of it, more of it from Wyoming. And you can see the change in western coal being low sulfur and the eastern coal being medium to high sulfur. Um, a growth in surface mining versus underground mining, because that's what we do in the west, but both of them are declining now, right? Because coal can't compete on the market. That's impacts on the coal and the feed stock that we're putting into our power stations. When we burn coal, there's stuff that doesn't burn. There's pieces of it that don't burn. And some of that goes out as particulates if you don't scrub it out in the, in the stacks. Or when you scrub it out and some of it's left kind of in the bottom of the boiler, this is what we call coal ash, or the industry calls them coal com combustion residuals, okay, CCRs. This is a, where we're, all, we're basically concentrating up those heavy metals that are in the coal because we've already burned off all the carbon and hydrogen to get the energy out, right? So we're concentrating these up. For a long time, these coal residuals were just put in big open pits, sometimes um, with water to try to keep the dust flying around, but sometimes not. They weren't regulated until 2015. And if you think about how long we've been using coal for generating electricity, it was a long time for this high, high metal, sometimes very radioactive material to be sitting in open pits and often unlined pits, like I said, not with water, that, that can impact communities and, and the environment. So it is only very recently that we've started regulating these. Um, and we've seen impact. Um, so this is a fish that's impacted by selenium contamination. In Idaho, um, you can see the deformation from the selenium contamination from the coal ash residuals. So it's these kind of impacts that we see on wildlife and then, of course, as people eat from these systems, it impacts people as well. How much do we produce? You get one ton of coal ash for every seven tons of coal you produce. So we have a lot of it that we have to figure out what are we gonna do with it now? And so there are new regulations um, that are doing something about that. Some people have looked at, can we do useful things with this instead of just trying to figure out a new way to isolate it from people in the environment? Can we make something useful? So we can, we can use it as often called fly ash in concrete. And so it lowers the content of cement. So it kind of lowers the carbon intensity of the concrete and can make it stronger. So for those of you who have been to Y2E2 building in, on campus, they used a big portion of fly ash in the concrete in that building. So the floors are all concrete. 
they have a pretty high portion of that concrete has that fly ash contained in that concrete. So you can see there's other things that people are looking at. What you want to make sure is when you're using it that it is chemically bound in that material so you're not just moving that contamination to somewhere else, right? And so that's why people look at concrete. It, can, it binds into the cement. Okay, so what are we doing with our giant uh, coal ash sites? Um, some places, like this is just showing an example in Tennessee where they have a coal ash management unit. A lot of places are having to move their coal ash to lined pits. They're, they're having to cover them. There's worry about it getting into groundwater and getting into rivers. Because a lot of these coal, these coal electricity generation facilities are next to water because they use that water for cooling the facility. And so you do worry about that contamination. There was a big spill um, in Kensington in Tennessee that really brought this to light. And the workers that had to help clean up that site had a lot of health impacts um, from, from that cleanup. So they weren't given proper safety equipment or um, kind, of, kind of told the risks as they cleaned up that site. And so there was a big spill of coal ash into the river and into the communities. Um, you know, overran some houses, things like that. And so that really brought this issue to light and, uh, and really prompted some of the policies we have. It's going to be something you have to monitor forever. Right? So none of these are, are forever solutions. And so you have to matter, monitor the groundwater and the local water systems basically forever with our coal ash. So there's lots, right? And so I had so many readings and videos for you guys. There's lots of environmental social impacts with coal on all parts of its system. Right? There are ways to mitigate some of those. There are ways we can do things safer in some of those things. The challenge is, is that we don't have solutions for all of those things. So this is just a, a list of some of the policies um, or, or regulations that either are or could be put in place to reduce some of those environmental risks. But when the industry or others talk about clean coal, this was a big thing a few years ago, talking about clean coal, they're really just talking about the carbon emissions. And that's just one of the impacts of using coal, right, are those carbon emissions. So carbon capture and storage is a technology we're going to learn more about in this, in this class. That yes, we could capture the carbon emissions from our coal-fired power plants, store them underground, and reduce that greenhouse gas emission impact from coal. But that doesn't change all of the other impacts that we've talked about, everything from the coal ash to the mining to the transportation, right? That's just one piece of, of our coal environmental story. Let's talk about the economics and future of coal in our, in our last two minutes. OK, so this is just to give you a sense of how much it costs per, per ton of coal. Um, if you don't have any like context for that, just think that coal is relatively cheap when you're just looking at it in a dollar per you know, energy. Um, so it is really some of the other aspects of coal that increase some of the cost, the environmental regulations, the dealing with the coal ash, the, the mining that's closing, it's making the coal more expensive. Um, so for a long time, it's been, it's been very a cheap resource, um, but it's no longer really competing with some of our other resources. So what am I showing you here? This is Lazard's uh, analysis of what it costs, the range of cost, levelized over the life of a project per energy you get out for different resources. So it's like a way of trying to compare very different resources, right? Where you're, you're talking about coal and natural gas, you have fuel costs over time. Wind and solar, it's all upfront costs, right? Your fuel is free, right? And so the, this is a way of levelizing that cost over the life of a project to try to compare them. And so what you're seeing here is the, the difference, and this is based on actual projects as much as they can. So they're looking at the industry, they update this every year, and seeing what actual projects look like. And so what I'm showing you here, this is for new, and this is unsubsidized, meaning it doesn't take into account some of the subsidies we have, for example, for wind and solar um, at the federal level or at the state levels. Right? So you can see coal here is coming in above new gas combined cycles, so that's natural gas at the bottom. Onshore wind and utility scale solar, they're all much cheaper to build new. But what we're finding today is that they're actually, even the existing coal-fired power plants are more expensive to run than building new 
wind and solar, and now new wind and solar with storage. So it is a game changer in terms of the market. And so that is why we will continue in the US to see coal uh, for our electricity generation decline um, because of these market forces. So much of it has been driven by natural gas. More going forward is going to be driven by wind and solar plus storage uh, based on, on markets. OK, so what does it look like? Coal-fired power plants are retiring. Um, this is kind of what we see every year. We're, we're turning off a lot of those coal-fired power plants. And then the best thing to do is reuse that electricity infrastructure to do something else. And so you, can, you see some places where they shut down the coal-fired power plant and build a, you know, a solar farm in that location and make use of the electricity infrastructure that's already there. And so we can repurpose some of these sites. One of the sites we go to here in California is a closed nuclear power plant called Rancho Seco that has become a giant solar farm. So they closed the nuclear power plant in the 80s, and they've put solar panels in, and they just continue to grow and grow and grow the solar uh, facility there because they have a lot of electricity infrastructure from that nuclear power plant. So we can repurpose some of these brownfields as we're shutting down these coal-fired power plants. OK, let's talk about mining and bankruptcies a little bit. Um, so in the US, we have regulations for our industries, and this includes oil and gas, includes coal, where you, if you're mining, you have a responsibility to return that, that land to something that is similar to what it was before you started mining or drilling or whatever you're doing. Okay, those are our policies. That is a requirement of a part of basically the agreement that you're making when you're leasing that land. The challenge is, is that coal was able to kind of make this loophole that's called self-bonding. And so what does self-bonding mean? Self-bonding meant that they said, well, instead of setting money aside to do that mining reclamation, we're always going to be so valuable as companies that we will be able to do that reclam reclamation just by the value of our company. And so this self-bonding has left a lot of these mines that closed down with bankruptcies abandoned. And now it is the responsibility of taxpayers, states, local communities, the federal government to clean up those mining sites. So this is another aspect where the cost of that environmental impact and those social impacts in some places were not taken into account by the, the coal mining industry. And so this is just showing you a list of some of the biggest US coal companies that have, that have declared bankruptcy. And they do that, and they basically get out of having to reclaim the mines that they're shutting down. And so leaving these exposed to the atmosphere, to the water, is really um, a risk for contaminating our water systems, because they're not doing the reclamation that is required. OK, so that's one aspect. The other aspect, obviously, is the communities. So we talked about that it's not like it's a huge workforce. It's not a huge portion of our US workforce that's in coal mining. But it's very important to certain communities. Sometimes it's the only job in town. And so there is this you know, idea of what, what do we owe those communities in terms of they've spent a long time powering our, our country. What do we owe them in terms of transitioning away from these, these um, coal mining and, and other things? And so we see this come up a lot in um, our, the politics is this, this tug of war of, of what do we do? How, what, do, what is the responsibility of governments in terms of fueling this, this energy transition? And so we see incentives, like we talked about earlier, in the Inflation Reduction Act, that you get more benefit if you're helping to transition some of these communities to cleaner energy technologies. Finally, let's talk about what's happening um, not just, so that was a lot about in the US. Let's talk about what's happening in the world. OK, so what I'm showing you here is the global coal capacities. So these are additions and retirements. So this is how much is being added or taken offline each year. As so you can really see, the US and Europe um, net retirements, China net additions. What does this mean when we're still building coal-fired power plants today in China? Much of these coal-fired power plants, they're brand new, and they're going to be operating for decades into the future. And so we see that China has very young coal-fired power plants, where in the US and in Europe, they're much older. Right? And so we have other 
reasons to shut them down. They've kind of uh, exceeded their life. There's a lot of updates that would have to happen to keep them operating. It's a little easier to shut them down where these, these very new coal-fired power plants, there's a lot of question about how long and how many of those will be operating into the future. And it really impacts what our coal future looks like um, in terms of those young uh, power plants for coal. The IEA tried to do some analysis on this. They have some like, different global policies. So list, you know, they list some here. Um, steps is basically just like there's the stated policies scenarios. Um, APS is advanced pledges. So people that have said stuff but don't, never, don't necessarily have policies in place. And then the net zero energy scenario is that, that last one. And so what actually happens for implementation of policies really impacts what the future of coal consumption is. Um, so climate is going to be a major driver, um, either having climate policy or a lack of climate policy. In China, we have seen some movement on this, especially when uh, um, it's not just a climate problem, it's an air pollution problem. And so, you know, Beijing Olympics was one of those times where they shut down a lot of coal-fired power plants because that impacts the air quality of Beijing a lot. Uh, unlike here in the US, where our coal-fired power plants tend to be pretty far from populations, in China, they can be much closer to populations. And so they can have a very big impact on air pollution in addition to climate change. And so what we see is sometimes it's easier to get an air pollution policy in place that has climate benefits than it is just to talk about a, a greenhouse gas emission reduction policy. Because those air pollutions are very vis visible and they have very immediate health impacts on people. And so this is a, just a place to watch on what's going to happen in the future for China. Okay, so that's all I had for today.